It is good to see everybody this morning. We're so glad that you chose to get up and come and worship with us. We are a better church when you are here. If you happen to be a guest today, we ask you to do one thing, and that is to fill out a connection card. That connection card is in the seat back in front of you. If you'd fill that out, drop that into the offering plate. We would love to connect with any of our guests. Just a couple of highlights. Hopefully you saw the... Uh, the video up there, don't forget next Sunday we have our, our voting for the pastor search committee. That will be at the conclusion of the service. Uh, absentee ballots are available in the church office. They are due by Friday. You have to get those tuned in by Friday. Don't forget right after church we have our fifth Sunday fellowship. Are we ready to worship? All right, why don't we stand and do our call to praise together. Praise the Lord. Praise, O oh, servants of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your light. We are here for you. We are here for you. Our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down. Let our shout be your anthem, your renown fill the skies. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. We are here for you. We are here for you. You are hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You are our holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. You are hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You are our holy. offering this morning. He indeed is worthy. Would you turn around and greet one another? I want to see you. 
with us as we see the holy, holy, set-apart God. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, God. Thank you for a time to, to gather into this place, God. 
Lord, you are holy, holy, holy as we have just got done singing, God. We are so grateful for that, God. Lord, we also welcome you into this place, God. Let us see, see you, God, during this hour, Lord. Help us to push aside all that's happened this last week, the distractions, Lord, the good, the bad, God, and focus in on you, God. Lord, we just love you so much. We thank you for every person in this sanctuary. Thank you for every person that can, that can hear our voice, God. Lord, help us to, to glorify you in everything we do, God. Lord, we just love you and praise you. For this all in your son, precious name, Jesus. Everybody said, thank you. You may be seated. Praise our great God. Praise to the Lord Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is the 
child and salvation. All ye who hear, how to his temple draw near. Join me in that adoration. Praise to the Lord who are all things so wondrous Shelters the under his wings, yes, so gently sustained. As the mercy, how are the longings that men granted in what he ordained? Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work.
and once more. Here are the Lord, the famous one, famous one. Praise your name in all the earth. The heavens declare. The heavens declare your glorious, glorious wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my always pray without ceasing in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus father we rejoice this morning we rejoice in your greatness we rejoice in your fame we rejoice in your presence and we thank you this morning for Jesus Christ for the new life that he gives us through his death on the cross and resurrection. We thank you for the good gifts that you give, for you are the giver of all good gifts. And we come now to bring just a portion of what you've given to us back to you, that you may use it for your kingdom and for your kingdom's glory. Continue to open our hearts to your presence 
and your voice this morning, and we will be sure to give you the glory. For it is in your son's precious names that we pray. Amen. And you may be seated.
your name high this morning, for you are worthy of all our praise and all our adoration. We honor you this morning. And we come before you with ears open to hear your word through the voice of your servant Vince. We pray that you would empower him, inspire him, and that, Father, our hearts would be open to that message and our minds would be obedient to the truth that is preached. We love you. May we walk out of here to be changed, never ever to be the same again. We ask that in your holy names. And all God's people said, Amen. Vince. Amen. Thank you, Bill and, and praise team and, and worship choir. We, we thank you for your, your leadership and, and leading us to the throne in our time of, of worship. Amen. Aren't we so glad that the cross is enough, that the cross was enough and is enough in our, in our day-to-day lives? We're going we're gonna to start a five-week journey, and we're calling this uh, Ministry uh, in the Ordinary, all right? That's the overarching theme. It kind of came out of a devotion I did uh, a, a couple months ago. Of, of doing that is ministering in the ordinary in your day-to-day life and letting God minister to you in your day-to-day life. And sometimes we, we miss on opportunities to minister to others. And sometimes we, we miss opportunities when God is ministering to us because of our, our busyness of our life. Now, it just so happens about every, uh, every week's theme is based off of food like true Baptist form. So we may get done earlier and earlier as I begin to talk about more food and we can get out of here and get some lunch, right? Uh, So today we're talking about this idea of food uh, from the harvest and we're looking at John chapter 4 and I, like Pastor James, true form, I changed the scripture in the middle of the week, so... Um, but it, it's, it's relatively close to that. It's John chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 27, actually. Uh, but before we get to that, that passage, we're gonna, we have to kind of set it up because we have to look at the, what happened right before that. And it's, it's, I love this interaction that we see with the woman at the well. It's, it's a great example of, of what Christ came to do because Christ oftentimes in his ministry, had to deal with confusion. And I think it kind of dealt with, with two, this, two ideas, two things that we often get confused about, but especially during the time of Jesus' ministry that the people got confused about. And those two confusions came about with what Jesus had to offer, what he came to offer. And we know it as he came to offer eternal life through dying on the cross. But then during that time, we, we, we forget or we, sometimes we look over the fact they thought he was going to bring his kingdom here on earth and he was going to raise up and be this king on earth and was going to kind of bring the kingdom of God of Israel back together and back into the fold of, of power. He also had to deal with his teachings the confusion of his teaching, more importantly, how he lived, because he lived against culture. He lived against what they expected a king to do. He ex- lived against what they expected the Messiah to do. So oftentimes in his, his dealing, especially with his disciples, but also with, with people that weren't his disciples, he had to deal with those two type of confusions. And he kind of hits on both of those in, in John chapter 4. So we see at the beginning of John chapter 4 that Jesus has to leave Judea because he's coming under fire about him baptizing. And we see in scripture there that it talks about it wasn't him baptizing, but his disciples and and all that. So the Pharisees were getting upset with him. So he decided he had to leave Judea to go back to Galilee. But again, against uh, what normally Jewish people would do, they would take a certain route to go around Samaria. They would not cross through Samaria, but he decided he was going to go right smack dab in the middle of Samaria. And he gets there about midday, and we see where it, he, we see his full human form, and it says that he is tired. Who wouldn't be tired? You know, we we today I wore my 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 umbrella socks. In hopes of rain, maybe soon, you know, fully prepared in hopes of rain. But he was walking through the desert, and it's the middle of the day, it's hot, and we see where we just look over it and see, oh, yeah, of course he's going to stop. But it, it shows his true human form that he was fully human, but also fully God. So about midday, and, and he stops, and his disciples go on to find some food, because what, what good road trip is without food, right? Uh, we all have our favorite road trip food. Mine is gummy blue sharks. Uh, those are the best. 
uh, of the best. I haven't had those in a while since we were trying to be healthier, so I haven't gone and I almost bought some the other day, but I opted out of it. Uh, but bunny, gummy blue sharks are the best road trip food ever. Uh, and a good Mountain Dew, like that's, that's it. You know, that's, that's all you need to survive a long road trip. But so they stop and they have to get food. So they go off and Jesus goes to the well at midday and we, he has this encounter with this woman. And we must realize that often that when he has this encounter, this is one of those things he's living against what people think he should be doing. Because one, just the cultural context of being a Samaritan woman, he shouldn't have any interaction with them because Samaria kind of lies right there in the middle. They, they had Jacob's well. They built their own altar, their own uh, temple there that they believed was the place that they were supposed to worship. Where Jewish thought Jerusalem was the place where we're supposed to worship. There was that cultural uh, just stigma that happened that they automatically didn't like each other. Right, and also the idea of Samaritans, they didn't, they only looked at the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, they didn't look at the prophets. So the Jews and the Samaritans, obviously, one on one, did not get along. But not only that, we see that it was a woman he interacted with. Culturally, men did not interact with women outside of their home. Like men didn't even interact with their own wives out in public. Like they didn't have conversations out in public. They only did that in their home. So for Jesus to approach this woman out in public, it's not even his, a woman that he is related to, is very much, again, against that idea of what Jesus should be doing. And we see it a step further in that who the woman was in the fact that she had five husbands, and it's revealed to us she's living with a man that was not her husband at all. So even furthermore, the moral standards. So Jesus should never have had this conversation, but we know that because Jesus is who he is, he's going to utilize this idea. So in these two passages, there's two symbols that we, we see, and we see it a lot in Scripture. Water versus food, right? So Jesus goes up to her thirsty and says, hey, can I have a drink of your water? And her response is, why are you even talking to me? Like this shouldn't, interaction shouldn't be happens. And he uses that as a segue into his conversation. That, hey, I have water that you can drink of that you will never be thirsty again. Like that sounds pretty legit, right? It's almost, almost to, Baja Blast is almost to that level of water that you would never need to know. If you know uh, Taco Bell, Baja Blast, Mountain Dew, like it's almost to that level of water, but it's not quite there. But so she's like, give me some of this water. I want some of this water. And that you see in their interaction, she, she still ultimately sees this, this time of the shift is, oh, he's the Messiah, you know, at first she thinks, are you a prophet because you're telling me things about me that no one else knows? He, then he ends it with, she goes, Aren't you, are you the Messiah? He says, I am the Messiah. So that's where we pick up in verse 27. We see this idea that the water that he has this conversation about offers salvation. And that's kind of the first symbol that we get before the second symbol that we're going to see in verse 27. So we're going to jump right there. Uh, John chapter 4, verse 27. For those that have uh, technology and want to know what translation, today, because it's large print, is a uh, New Living Translation. So, a few people asked me what translations I like to use, and I said, whichever one is easiest to read uh, for me out loud. So there's no big, uh, big thing. I, I study from all different, all different translations, but today, because we have our large print Bible, we're going to read out of the New Living Translation. Starting in verse 27, it said, Just then his, disciple, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, just like we were just talking about. But none of them had the nerve to ask. They've kind of learned at this point. They knew, all right, Jesus is Jesus, all right? So what do you want, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? Now, she still hasn't quite fully grasped who Jesus was, but she had an idea of it. So she's going back and doing that. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. So now all of a sudden they're, they're, they're drawing a crowd. Jesus is drawing a crowd in the middle of the village in the middle of the day. All right. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus. So the disciples have returned. Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. And they start looking at each other and say, did someone bring food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. 
You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around you. The fields are already ripe for the harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is the people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvests. And it is true, I sent you to the harvest where you, where you did not plant. Others have already done the work, and now you will get together to gather the harvest. We're going to stop there for just a moment. So Jesus' disciples have returned, and he, he sees an opportunity to, to teach them something in the midst of this. I just think it's a comical that, it, it, that John states that they had, didn't have the nerve to ask Jesus why. Because at this point, they've begun to learn, all right, Jesus is going to do something different here. Now, we can't question his, his moral standards, obviously, because they knew he was the Messiah. He was God in, in the flesh. So we're not going to question that. So I just think it's comical that he kind of points that out. So they say, all right, here, Jesus, have some food. They're trying to urge him to give them those, those snacks. Well, of course, they're offended by the fact that Jesus says, I have something that is greater than what you have. So they're thinking still in the realm, they're confused, they're like, why, who would bring him food? Why would he knew we were going to go get food? You know, times uh, when, Mary Helen can attest to this, when we travel, she's learned that sometimes when we stop to get gas, if we're getting a snack, that sometimes I just like to go inside and browse. She knows what I typically like, uh, a good soda and uh, gummy blue sharks, but she knows that sometimes, you know, as a typical man, I change my mind, and I want to go have control of what I want, and I want to go look. I might still pick out the gummy blue sharks, but I want to look and see what they have. So there's, there's, ne- there's never that tension there. She's learned that, do you want me to go get you something, or do you want to go in yourself? And it's kind of like, well, I'll just go in myself. But here the, the disciples come back, and they're frustrated because they think Jesus has food. Now, Jesus is about to flip the table on them and teach them uh, two very important points. And he uses two different old proverbs, old sayings to teach that point. All right, the first one there is in verse 35. He says, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up. Other translations say, look up, uh, open your eyes. And look around, the fields are ripe for the harvest. So there's a lot of debate why he says four months in this time, because typically they say it's six months between the, the sowing and the reaping, as some translations say. And it's, what it's saying there is it's the, the last point you can plant to the earliest point. That's why there's four months. So they're saying there's a time of waiting Jesus is showing them, he says, first of all, the food I receive, the food that nourishes me, he says, is by doing what God has told me to do, what I'm here for. He's saying the same thing with us. Water brings about salvation. Water is the the symbolism of salvation, of eternal life. But as you receive that water, now it's time to move from water to food. And he's saying that food is what I am having right now. I'm doing the Father's will. He's saying because of that, he's saying a time is now. There is no waiting period. There is no time to, to hold off. The time is now to do what God has called us to do. And in the midst of that, he's saying it, literally to the disciples, he's saying, wake up. Look around. The harvest is plentiful. Now we see that as, hey, you know, the time is now. The time is go to share the gospel is now. He was specifically talking to the, the disciples because literally the Samaritans were coming. They were starting to flood the area they were in, which was very hard for the disciples to swallow. This is a moment in time that I like to call crossing the track moments. He was forcing the disciples to get out of their comfort zone in order to do what God wanted them to do. It was very uncomfortable for first the fact that they were in Samaria. Now he wants you, wants us, he wants them to talk to Samaritans about Jesus. How, how in the world would he allow that to do? But he just before that, he says, God is going to nourish that. So the idea of what we're called to do in the meantime or what we're called to do in ministry in the ordinary is to wake up and look around you. There are people in your life, in your, in your day-to-day life, that God has called you to minister to. 
God is going to, through that, is going to grow you, stretch you, and nourish you in the midst of all that. He's saying, wake up, look out, look up. The Samaritans are coming. He said, sometimes it just takes crossing the tracks. Some of you are looking at, what does that mean, crossing the tracks? It means talking to people you normally wouldn't talk to. Going to people that normally would not be inside your circle of influence, your circle of friends. Now, those are the times that God wants to use us the most. It's times that we are talking to people we're not very comfortable talking to. Times we're sharing Christ with people that we're not very comfortable sharing Christ with. God says, wake up, look around you. The harvest is plentiful. Crossing the track moment. So he, he, he hits this idea of looking at what the disciples are doing. That first thing, the harvest is now. There is no waiting period. He's saying the, the time of waiting has, has already passed. It's time to see those fruits. So the second part of this proverb, he hits down in verses 36 through 38. He says, the harvesters are paid at good wages, and the fruit they harvest are the people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and the other harvests. And it is true. I sent you to harvest where you did not plant. Others have already done the work. Now you will get to gather the harvest. The old proverb, proverb, and it kind of relates back to Micah chapter 6, verse 15. It says, you do not harvest what you do not sow or what you plant. What that's saying is the picture that it gives us there is this picture of a farmer. If there's, there's a boundary between this farmer's land and that farmer's land, whether there's a fence or not, is a farmer going into another farmer's land and harvesting what's not his. That's a negative connotation. A judgment happens there. It's, it's, it's wrong to do that. How dare you steal from another harvester? My mom, I remember when we moved to southern, uh, southern part of Indiana. Uh, it was the first time we ever saw, uh, actually this wasn't, this is the first time when we moved to South Georgia now. Sorry, I got my stories mixed up. Moved to South Georgia. I tell people when we moved from Indiana to South Georgia, culturally it's very much the same. Uh, it's just people, they, they didn't have the, the same accents, obviously. Um, but also, we just traded our, our cornfields for cotton fields. Like, that's all we did. It's, instead of cornfields, we have cotton fields. We don't have any snow in South Georgia. So, but I remember my mom first, we first, she got super excited about all the cotton fields that were around. Like, I don't know why, she just got really excited. So she thought this great idea that she would stop on the side of the road and get some of the cotton that was there. She was immediately informed that that's a big no-no. Like, you don't go into people's cotton fields. Like, you don't do that. Uh, I don't know if that's true here in Texas, but in South Georgia, you don't touch nobody's cotton fields unless it's your own. So that's the same concept here. She didn't plant that. She didn't put the effort into harvest, uh, planting that or sowing that. Jesus is saying that's not the case now. He's saying that he's debunking that. He's also saying that in in the kingdom, he also says that we have great reward for both the harvester and the planter or the sower. He's saying there's great reward in both. He's saying we all have different parts to play in this, this game we called life. He said we all have times that we sow, we all have times that we plant, we also have times that we get to harvest, we get to see the fruit, we get to reap the fruit from our harvest. He's saying that's only God to decide. God's going to be one that directs, because remember, he's the one that's nourishing us, he's the one that's giving us the food, he's the one that is showing us his will. All we are called to be is just to be sowers or harvesters, planters or reapers. That's all he's calling us to do is to be faithful in the time. Sometimes that's called to call to tr- cross the tracks. Even so much so, he's saying there's unity in that. It's no more division between the reapers and sowers. He's saying there's no more division, there's unity. So much so that we see a little bit of glimpse of this when the Samaritan woman leaves and goes tells the people about who he, she just met. We get to see that happening in real time in this passage. We get to see her getting to go and experience fruit that she didn't plant. She goes and says that this guy knows everything about me and in every, in every truth that is happening in those people's heads. Why should we listen to her? But there's something about it that they drew them in, that they're all starting to go, that all this is happening because of one thing. And that's Jesus 
and be able to cross the track and show people why it's important. Then we're going to jump down. I stopped. We're going to jump down in verse 39. 39 through 42, something happens. It says, Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days. Not only did he stop there, he stayed for two days. Long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not just because of what you told us, because we have heard from him ourselves. Now we know that he indeed is the Savior and Lord. The great thing about this story is the fact of what I just alluded to just a second ago. Whether you're the, the planter or the harvester, whether God calls you to be either one of those at different points in your life, to the people around you, he's saying, the great thing is this. Jesus ultimately is the one that's going to see it through. Just like the Samaritans saw that in her that there was something that sparked something new inside the Samaritan woman. But they said, we first kind of got this idea from you, but we ultimately believed when we saw it for ourselves. So in, our, in the ordinary ministry of our lives, in the day-to-day of our lives, God says, get nourishment from me by doing what I've called you to do. Matthew, the, the Great Commission says to go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus said, love, other, love God and love others just the same. It's, that is doing ministry in the ordinary. Sometimes that means crossing the track to people that we don't typically talk with. Sometimes that means in the, 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 the checkout line at Walmart, having a conversation with someone you don't normally have a conversation with. Jesus talked to a woman at the well that he should never have talked to. God has called us to, to fulfill his will, and through that, he's going to continue to grow us and give us strength. Another picture that we see this idea of God giving us food. So athletes, uh, professional bodybuilders, they, they, it's all about how, what you take in after you work out. If you know anything about working out, you know that it breaks down your muscles, right? In the midst of that, you have to replenish your, your nutrients that you're using and, and to build back your muscles. I remember in college, I began, I, I mean, I worked out my whole life, but I really didn't understand this until someone explained it to me, and it happened to me in college. My freshman year, I got redshirted at Georgia Southern, so that means I didn't play the season. So what did I want to do as, as a 19-year-old boy? I was like, well, I'm just going to work out as much as I can, get as big, as strong, as fast as I can during this time, which was good. I began to take some supplements, nothing illegal, just so you know. But I began to take supplements to help in the midst of this working out. Not really truly knowing that the supplements were there to, to help, but they weren't fully what I absolutely needed. I needed more than these supplements. But in the midst of all that, I didn't properly do what I was uh, supposed to do in eating and stretching after working out. I end up uh, tearing up my shoulder the next year. So I didn't get to play as much because my, my shoulder was messed up because I didn't have the proper nutrition understanding. Same thing with us. It's if we're being filled by the right thing, and that's doing God's will. When we step outside of that, it's like eating food that's not nourishing us, eating food that doesn't do what it's supposed to do. God has called us to do His will. Ultimately, He's saying the harvest is is now. The time is now. Every day is now. People are there. People you interact with every day need to know about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. With that, there's times that you're going to plant and there's times that you're going to reap or harvest that fruit. We're just called to be faithful. We're going to celebrate in both of them. Celebrate in planting seeds and celebrate in harvesting the fruit. Because ultimately, it's Jesus who gets the glory. That's how we minister in the ordinary. Doing God's will, giving Jesus the glory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, God, I thank you for this idea of, of this, this picture that we see in John chapter 4, that ultimately salvation comes from you, Lord, and that we know that for us, that, that know that, God, help us to move to the next step of, of getting nourishment from you by doing your will, God. 
Lord, if there's anybody in this room today that does not have salvation, does not know the saving salvation that your water has to offer, God, I pray that they will make that decision today. Lord, for the rest of us that have, have made that decision, God, no matter how long ago or how short ago, God, that we know that the harvest is plentiful, God. Lord, times that we're called to be planters and time that we're called to be harvesters, Lord, just help us to be faithful in our day-to-day lives and who we are called to share your salvation with, God. Ultimately, we know it comes from you, God. Ultimately, we know that you are the one true God, Lord. We thank you for those. Thank you for the times that we, we fall short in the midst of this life, God. Fulfill us and fill us, God. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to enter into a time of response. Uh, Today is going to look a little bit different. Uh, Bill and I were talking in staff meeting. We're still, if you if you have a decision to make, whether you want to come and accept Jesus Christ for the first time, I I will be down here. If you want to come and decide that this is the fellowship uh, that you want to be a part of, if you're not a member of First Baptist Church, that 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 is still open. That invitation is open. As we all know, next week we enter into a time of, of, of voting for our pastor search committee. We want this, to, this, this uh, time of decision, we also want this to be a time of dedication to be in prayer for those names that we're going to put on the ballots and those that are selected, that they would seek out who God would have for our church. So during this time of invitation, obviously, like I said, if you have a decision to make, I will be down here. Please come and and speak to me. But for for the rest of us, this altar is open. Please and and make this time to come down and and pray for our church, pray for our time of voting, and pray for those that would be on that, that pastor search committee, that it would be God who puts them on there. And God who guides them in the midst of this time. So I would encourage you, this altar open, come down, you can pray. Here you can stand here and pray. Uh, And then hopefully next week as we get into that time, it'll be led by God. Bill, would would you leave us in this time? Would you stand and join with us? Come out of sadness wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, the rest you begin. Come find your mercy, O sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven 